The topic that I've chosen today is blameless. And many a times we like to be blameless in whatever we do. This topic, I was reading uh, the book of Genesis and this topic was inspired from the book of Genesis. Look at this picture, the World Trade Center. I hope everybody remembers what has happened to the World Trade Center in 1993. These two tall towers were destroyed by terrorists. About 2,977 people died and more than 6,000 people were injured. Two monumental buildings that were standing in New York were totally grounded. And who is responsible for this incident? Everybody knows it's Al-Qaeda. See, there is an opportunity for people to blame somebody here. Like that, from the time of Adam, when Adam fell, Adam and Eve blamed Satan. And because of the sin that first existed, there was so much that was going on in the world and the sin was just continuing to grow and grow and grow. It came to a point where God became so angry that he wanted to destroy the entire earth. And during the time of Noah, except for Noah's family, the entire earth was destroyed. Now after the flood, God wanted to re-establish the broken relationship that God cut off with the human beings because of sin. He wanted to re-establish this broken relationship with human beings. And he chose Abraham to establish this relationship back. What did God ask Abraham to do? In Genesis chapter 17 verse 1, it says, I am God Almighty. God came down from heaven to establish the relationship back. And he, before making a covenant with Abraham, he came down and visited Abraham and said, I am God Almighty. And he said, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. This is the scripture that has been in my mind, which led me to select this topic. Now, the question is, what does it mean to be blameless? The meaning of being blameless, according to the dictionary, means innocent of wrongdoing, guiltless, free from, not deserving blame. We who believe and follow Jesus Christ should understand who and what we are in Jesus Christ. If we don't understand this fundamental thing, then we, then our perception of God would be different. We would always think that we can please God in the flesh. Why is it impossible for us to please God in the flesh? In Romans chapter 8 verse 7 to 8, I'm reading from New King James Version. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. 
So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Our, our physical, our fleshly, our carnal mind is always at enmity with God and his ways. It, the mind does not subject itself to God's laws. It can never be because it has been influenced by sin. And that is why it says that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's look at another translation from the Good News translation where it reads. And so people became enemies of God when they are controlled by their human nature. For they do not obey God's law and in fact they cannot obey it. It's put very nicely. The human nature that is within us is controlled in such a way that it cannot obey God's law completely and fully. In fact, it cannot obey God or please God. So, we who believe and follow Jesus Christ, who understand, should understand who we are in Christ. In Romans chapter 5 verse 10 it says, because of a human nature, we are enemies of God. But when we are in this state, God has reconciled us back to him. Let's read Romans chapter 5 verse 10. For if we, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God to the death of his son. Reconciliation means to restore a friendly relationship between God and human beings. God wanted to re-establish this broken relationship that has taken place from the time of Adam to want to bring back this friendly relationship between God and man. So, Apostle Paul is saying, if we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So, we who follow Jesus Christ, we should worship and follow God, not in flesh, but in the spirit. Our focus is to live a life, a life in the spirit. Romans 8, 1 says, for those, for there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Yes, we who believe and follow Jesus Christ understand in our mind that the human nature cannot please God. It is the spirit of God that dwells within us, help us to live a life that is helping us to walk according to the spirit. Let's look at verse 6. The mind is governed by the flesh. The mind that is governed by the flesh is death. But the mind that is governed by the spirit is life and peace. So it very clearly states, if you choose the way of flesh, it only leads to death. But when you choose a mind that is governed by the spirit, there is life and peace. Let's look at Romans 8 verse 9 to 11. We have to remember who we believe and follow Jesus Christ. We should understand who we are in Jesus Christ. Let's read from verse 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but you are not in the flesh, 
but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, now if anyone does not have the spirit of God, he is not his. See, it clearly says that we have to be in the spirit to belong to Jesus Christ. If God's spirit is not dwelling within us, then we don't belong to Jesus Christ. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raises Christ from the dead will also give you give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. God's spirit raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And God is offering the spirit to all of us so that we can be found in Jesus Christ. And if God's spirit is dwelling in us, then we are in his, we are his. We can be called his children. Because of the spirit that is dwelling in us, And, and is actively working in each one of us and helping us to convict us of our wrongdoings, we ought to have a behavior that is according to God's will. We ought to have a way of living that demonstrates the very nature of God in us. Let's read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where Apostle Paul lists out, lists out a few behaviors that we need to adapt when we say our behavior should be according to God's will. Apostle Paul in his great experiences uh, going about in the Asian countries has instructed many places and now this time in Thessalonica he, he tells the Thessalonians what kind of behavior that we ought to have because of God's spirit dwelling in us. Our behavior should be such where we have to demonstrate a life that exhibits the very nature of God in us. Let's read from Philippians chapter 4, verses 3 to 11. For this is the will of God, your sanctif sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to be unclean, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so towards that all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk properly towards those who are outside, that you may lack nothing. Let's summarize what Apostle Paul is telling that our behavior should be when it talks about 
the spirit of God dwelling in us. In verse 3 it says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. That means to say, it is, God will, it is God's will that you should be set apart. Verse 4 it says, learn to control your body in a way to present, to be holy and honorable. It also says in verse 6, not to take advantage, undue advantage of your brother and your sisters. Verse 7, it says, God called us to be holy. Verse 10, to love all of God's family, to show that love that God has shown each and every one of us through his spirit. To love all of God's family, whether you know them or you don't know them, more and more. To make it an ambition in life. To lead a quiet life. To mind your own business. To work hard with your own hands. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. So that you will not be dependent on anybody. God is telling us through Apostle Paul that our behavior should be in such that it demonstrates the very nature of God within us. In Philippians chapter 2, 14 to 15, it also says, when you look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, do not do nothing out of selfish amb ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. See, these are some of the outlines that Apostle Paul is giving about our behavior that we need to have. Looking, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. And in verse 14 of Philippians chapter 2, it says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. When we look back into our own lives, how many times we have been looking into our own interest, not at the interests of others? How many times if some task is given to us, we always grumble and argue with those people who give us a task? And I myself, I am a person sometimes who grumbles and argues for nothing when I could have done it without a word. Why is Paul telling us to have a kind of behavior in our life when God's spirit dwells in us? So that in verse 15 it says, so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault, wrapped eh, in a crooked generation that is there. There is a blessing to this. When we have such kind of behavior that is imbibed in us through the Spirit, there is a blessing also in verse 15b, it says, when you adapt such kind of behavior, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. What is it that makes us blameless before God? Doing all of these things, having the best attitude, best behavior, makes us blameless in front of God? No, these are the responsibilities that we need to have as a behavioral pattern when we have God's Spirit dwelling in us. What is it when I say that we are blameless in Christ? In Colossians 1 verse 21 to 23 says, And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he, reckons, he has reconciled in the body of his flesh to death to present you holy and blameless 
and above reproach in his sight. We who follow Jesus Christ, who are called his own, at a given point of time, our mindset is so carnal that no matter what we do, cannot please God. Our minds and our works are so wicked that we are termed as enemies of God. But Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, in the great provision of our triune God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, in the body of his flesh, through his death, has presented us to the Father to be holy and blameless. We are blameless in the sight of our Father because of Jesus Christ. We should understand that God does not see us or seek to deal with us based on who we are in the flesh, but on who we are in the spirit. In the spirit, we are presented to God as holy, righteous, perfect, and blameless in Christ. This will radically change when we understand who we are in Christ. This will radically change our disposition or attitude towards God. When we understand who we are in Christ, it completely eradicates and eliminates fear, shame, guilt, condemnation from our heart when we stand in God's presence. But when we don't understand who we are in Christ, the devil primarily applies and uses the emotions of fear, shame, guilt and condemnation to hold you back from standing boldly in the presence of God. And it is trying to block and trying to stop you from receiving the benefits and the blessings of the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you focus on who you are in the flesh, you are simply carnally minded and walking after the flesh and the devil will find many things that he can use to condemn you because you are not without sin in your flesh. He takes that opportunity when we have the mind of a flesh in us. He takes the opportunity to condemn you before God. He can find so many reasons to condemn you. But when you choose to focus on who you are in the spirit, that is holy, righteous and perfect and blameless, and Spirit, when you are spiritually minded and walking according to the spirit, the devil cannot find anything he can accuse you of because you are without sin in your spirit. Dear brethren, you will not enjoy God's best for your life if you choose to be preoccupied with who you are in the flesh and not who you are in the spirit in Christ Jesus. When you are preoccupied or obsessed with your sins, shortcomings, failures, imperfections, or weakness in the flesh, you are simply self-conscious and self-centered, and not Christ-conscious and Christ-centered. 
when we are preoccupied with the flesh our time of prayer becomes a time of wrestling with god when we are preoccupied with the flesh we tend to ask god to bless us and we wonder why god is not blessing us why we are not why god is not helping me out and not intervening and not honoring my requests the time that we spend in prayer is is like a battle that is going on between us and god when we are preoccupied with the flesh but when we are preoccupied in the spirit and when you understand what your identity in christ is our attitude itself changes we look forward for a time of prayer a time of enjoying a loving and intimate relationship with god an intimate fellowship a communion with our loving and gracious heavenly father we thank him for the work that he has done through jesus christ for releasing us out of the clutches of the flesh and giving us that life and peace and we communicate more with him spending that time joyously with our father in prayer god loves us so much he accepts us completely in christ in spite of the shortcomings failures and imperfections and the weaknesses that we have in our flesh just like the example of the prodigal son yesterday i was talking to mr zakaria the prodigal son rejected god and went his own way when he came back all he had to do is go to his father and enjoy all the luxuries the honor that he had in his father's house you know the story all we have to do is go back to the father and enjoy the benefits and the blessings of the finished work of jesus christ god loves us and accepts us completely in christ in spite of our shortcomings failures and imperfections right now we who follow jesus christ are being progressively transformed into the image of christ in our will in our mind in our emotions and our actions and we are all waiting for the day when we will be physically transformed at the second coming of our lord certainly god is not ignorant of your sins or your shortcomings and your failures and imperfections and weaknesses in the flesh however god has not chosen to deal with us on who we are in the flesh but god has chosen to deal with us who we are in christ we are presented to god to be holy righteous and perfect and blameless in god's sight because of jesus christ now you may ask what is it that we should do when we sin again yes because of jesus christ we have to go back to him boldly we have to be focused on god and understand that god is the one 
who has redeemed us from the clutches of sin. He has done that work where we human beings cannot do. He has redeemed us. He has set us free in Jesus Christ. So when we sin, we have to go back to God boldly into his throne and in humility confess that we have done wrong. In Psalms 103, when we go back to him in humility, he forgives all our sins. And in verse 10 it says, as far as from the east is from the west, he has removed our transgressions from us. He has redeemed your life from destruction. It shows us that God is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and greatly abounding in mercy. In verse 10 it says, He has not punished us according to our sins. But when we go back to him in humility, asking God to forgive us, asking God to help us build a relationship back with him, God is so willing that he wants to crown you with his loving kindness and tender mercies. He wants to satisfy you with good things so that you can be renewed like the eagle again and start afresh again in that relationship that God wants to build between him and us. So I like to leave you with a point that we should go back to God boldly and be focused on him and understand that he has forgiven our, forgiven our sins and is presenting us as holy and blameless in and through Jesus Christ. God is looking at us from the lens of Jesus Christ, under the shadow of Jesus Christ, where Jesus Christ presented us to be blameless to God. And lastly, in humility, let's confess that we are wrong and repent of our sins and go back to him and enjoy the benefits and the blessings of the finished work of Jesus Christ in our lives. Let's enjoy this relationship in our God Almighty and let's, and let's not be burdened with guilt shame, condemnation, but enjoy the benefits of a vibrant relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. Thank you.